everybody it's April the 18th 2019 and it's just on 11 a.m. in the morning and finally here we are at podcast number 29 which is titled separation of the elements and we're going to discuss here what I refer to as the second stage of the acetate path great work which begins after pyrolysis is complete so it's coming into winter here it's already getting very cold in the morning and dark before I go to work and we've had our switch over of daylight saving 
which means filming outdoors is not as fun because the light isn't as good always so I'm having to look at going back to the way I previously used to make uh, videos with a bit of a new twist to it filming indoors like I am today and I've been learning OBS which is a piece of software that people use a lot for making YouTube videos so that they can have their face like this framed with a background picture doing whatever um, so today is my first attempt at producing a video with OBS which means no more excuses really for not making videos when the weather is poor as it is today um, because I can film in my lounge as I am so as I promised previously we are moving on to the next stage of the work which begins at the completion of pyrolysis if you're new to my channel and this is the first video you're looking at you need to go back and have a look at some of the previous videos uh, podcasts which describe the information which leads up to this one um, and now we're going to take the distillate that we collect after the pyrolytic distillation is complete and separate that distillate into it into the four elements the alchemical elements and then go through a process of reuniting them into a single homogeneous substance this is a subject which very few people understand and very few people know anything of detail about and I'm going to repeat this a number of times this is largely because they don't understand the language that the old alchemists discussed these uh, processes in the book that I'm going to be referring to and quoting from today reading from today is Sir George Ripley's bosom book which you can find a copy of in another text which is a collection of uh, alchemical small alchemical books called Collectania Chemica I think archive.org has copies of Collectania Chemica and I think Sacred Texts has a copy of it but anyway I'm going to reproduce pages from that text here and use them as the focus for this discussion okay so in our discussion of the acetate path we've already covered the initial steps of the process where we make a metallic acetate preferably lead acetate we subject that to pyrolytic distillation and the distillate which we collect in the receiver is basically two substances a dark dark red oil and a milky colored volatile fluid and we have left behind in the boiling flask a black crumbly mineral soot like substance so that's where we're going to pick up from at this point of our discussion and I'm going to refer here to Ripley's publication the bosom book now he did not publish this book himself but what happened was the semi-famous English alchemist Samuel Norton who was the grandson of Thomas Norton who published the book The Ordinal of Alchemy Thomas Norton was a student of George Ripley's so somehow Samuel Norton got his hands on original notes by George Ripley and we might assume that he got those original notes from his grandfather Thomas Norton now among those original notes was 
a manuscript that had Ripley's private and unencrypted notes on the process of the acetate path. Um, and Samuel Norton copied those notes into his own notebook. And this is what we see here on the left hand side of this page is the front page of Samuel Norton's original notebook from Ripley's original notebook. And I don't know whether Ripley gave it this title but Samuel Norton certainly wrote at the top here the bosom book of Sir George Ripley. In other words his private notebook where he wrote down all the details and clear unencrypted description of the acetate path work. And this is why Ripley's bosom book is such an important publication. And we can see his Samuel Norton's beautiful handwritten script here. Now what Samuel Norton then did or somebody after Samuel Norton got hold of Norton's notes on the bosom book and then cleaned up the manuscript and republished it as George Ripley's bosom book in a publication in 1683 which was a collection of small books on alchemy known as Collectania Chemica. And here we can see the title page of Ripley's bosom book from the original Collectania Chemica now in its cleaned up format. And um, I'm going to talk about the next stage in the acetate process after the pyrolytic dis distillation by quoting from the bosom book because it has the clearest description of um, this process and the most complete and unencrypted description um, that we can find anywhere just just about just about so the bosom book of Sir George Ripley and George Ripley was a, the canon of Bridlington which is a place in England so he was actually a monk a canon um, and we're told that this book contains his philosophic accurtations which are sort of side processes in the making of the philosophers mercury and elixirs and this is important because Ripley describes here something which virtually nobody else does and that is how the philosophic mercury is produced and that's what we're going to be talking about today because the next stage in the acetate path is actually an explanation of how the mercury of the philosophers is made and it's important that I point out right here that there's a lot of debate in the alchemical community about what philosophic mercury is and how it's produced and most of that discussion is not even in the ballpark of being accurate and we can see here in Ripley's text that has been experimented with and proved to be accurate and true in the lab a discussion of exactly how that process works and more importantly the kind of language that these acetate path alchemists used in order to discuss this entire subject. Ripley solves a number of problems where alchemical, hermetic, cryptic language is concerned here. Okay, so this is the first chapter of the bosom book and we can see each chapter has a title and this is quite a long one for the first chapter most of them are quite short titles and then this is the first chapter here uh, these images are taken from the original text of 1683 so you can see that it has the original English language and block print 
text still intact. These little numbers here, I've numbered each chapter just to make things easier for reference and I put them in red just to show that they are my numbering system. So this is what he says in the first chapter, the bosom book of Sir George Ripley, the whole work of the composition of the philosophical stone of the great elixir and of the first solution of the gross body. First take 30 pound weight of Sericon and Sericon is the Latinized translation of the Arabic Zarquin, which is the Arabic word for lead acetate. Uh, sorry, lead oxide. Sericon is lead oxide. So there's a, a lot of debate about the meaning of that word and why it's used, but that's the plain fact of the matter. When alchemical books in Arabic were first translated into Latin for the medieval uh, reader, they had to translate a lot of Arabic words that they had never seen before. This is technical language, so they had uh, they didn't know anything about alchemy. And so these words are technical language, and so they kind of phonetically translated them into Latin. Zarquin got translated into Sericon, or antimony, and this is a metaphor. It's, they don't actually mean take antimony, they're speaking about something else, but I'm not going to mention that here. All we need to know is that he's saying take Sericon, which is lead oxide, which will make about 21 pound weight of gum and that gum that he's referring to is lead acetate or near abouts if it were if it be well dissolved in other words the if the lead oxide is well dissolved and the vinegar very good in other words the acetic acid that you're using to dissolve the lead acetate has been distilled properly and therefore is strong and dissolve each pound thereof in a gallon of twice distilled vinegar when cold again and as it standeth in dissolution in the fit glass vessel stir it about with a clean stick every often, very often every day the oftener the better and when it is well molten in the bottom then filter so basically what he's saying is take your lead oxide put it in uh, concentrated vinegar which is basically uh, a solution of acetic acid stir it around in the jar as many times in a day as you can be bothered to and it will pretty rapidly dissolve the a portion of the lead oxide then filter over the liquors in other words filter the dissolved lead oxide three times and then keep that filtrate covered in a fit container so we're talking about a glass jar here he's probably talking about ceramic jar and then cast away the rubbish at the bottom of the original dissolution that was left over because it is superfluous filth which must be removed. This is the terra damnata, and entereth not into the work, and it is called terra damnata, or the damned or corrupt earth. Now in the second chapter here, here's the title, Making of Our Gum or Green Lion. Then put all these cold liquors, in other words, our, dis, our, our filtered lead oxide in acetic acid into a fit glass vessel, and he's talking here about a retort or a limbic, and set it into Balneo Marie, which is a water bath, to evaporate in a temperate heat, which done, our Sericon will be coagulated into a green gum called our green lion. So what he's saying is take the um, filtered dissolved lead oxide which is now lead acetate and put it in a glass vessel in a water bath so that it doesn't get too hot, heat it up 
evaporate all the acetic acid off and it will uh, the lead acetate will um, condense down or coagulate into a thick gum like substance and he's telling us here in no mixed language that this is what the acetate path alchemists call the green lion and it's called the green lion because often that gum or green that gum or lead acetate is a emerald green color not always but often it is and it depends on the way it's um, prepared how much lead you put into the acid how much of a concentration the acid has how often you stir it how warm it gets how many impurities are in the solution as to what color but because these guys kind of all followed the same recipe using the same lead as their starting material um, and prepared their acetic acid in the same way their vinegar more often than not when they got that concentrated lead acetate it was a green gum like substance so there's no argument here about what that is yet be aware not to burn its flowers nor destroy its greenness so when you're uh, evaporating the acetic acid off the lead acetate and coagulating the lead acetate down don't use so much heat that you burn the crystals that form this is what he means by flowers because um, the old alchemists believe that the crystallization of metals and minerals was the equivalent of flowering in the plant realm so don't ruin don't burn the crystals and don't heat it so much that the greenness of the gum is lost and that's important because they believed in that green color is the vegetable life that was contained in the acetic acid because acetic acid comes from in a way the second fermentation in of uh, plant materials in wine making or beer making chapter three the extraction of our menstrual or blood of our green lion so we now have a, our green lion which is a gummy coagulated lead acetate and he tells us then take out the gum and put it into a strong retort in other words a retort that has glass that's good enough to handle high temperature well looted which means that that distillation train the alembical retort has all the joints sealed up properly that's what loot is it seals the joints in the glassware place it in your furnace so we're not placing it on a balneo marie or an oil bath or a sand bath we're putting it in a high temperature uh, uh, ethanol and under that at the first make a sober fire and in other words start the fire off slowly so he's beginning to explain pyrolysis here which is where we got up to in our previous podcast and anon you shall see a faint water issue forth so the first thing that is distilled over at low temperature is actual water h2o let that waste away in other words bring all that water over at that low temperature and separate that water from what's going to start happening next but when you see a white smoke or fume issue forth then put into put put to a receiver of glass which must have a very large belly so once the water's all come over then we get the white fume and we've spoken about what the white fume is before that's actually uh, the chemical acetone and because it's a gas it's going to be hard in medieval times to condense that gas down into a liquid so you need a receiver that is like really big in order to handle all the gas going in and to be able to cool the receiver enough to condense that acetone gas into a liquid okay so the 
then increase your fire little by little in other words turn the heat up in stages till the fume which issue be readeth reddish so this is the red oil coming over at high temperature then continue the greater fire in other words a stronger heat until drops like blood come forth and no more fume will issue forth and when that leaveth bleeding let it cool or assuage the fire little by little and when all things are cold then take away the receiver and close it suddenly so what he's done is he's distilled the water and he separated that off and put it to one side then he's distilled put a new receiver on which is really big he's got the white fume into that receiver and then the red fume so both those things are have gone together over into the receiver and when the process is finished cools the system down very slowly if you don't the containers will crack from thermal shock and then he says when all things are cold then take away the receiver and close it fast suddenly in other words don't leave the receiver mouth open otherwise the volatile fluids inside will evaporate out and he says that here otherwise the spirits vanish so that the spirits vanish away not away for this liquor is called our blessed liquor which liquor keepeth close stopped in other words hermetically seal it in a glass till hereafter until we need to use it then look into the neck of the retort and therein you will find a white hard rime in other words sublimated salts of lead as it were the congelation of a frosty vapor or much like sublimate which gather with diligence and keep it apart to one side and we'll explain about what to do with that later that's what he says but we're not going to go into that yet so the next stage in his book he explains what to do with the black soot that's left behind and we're not interested in that discussion yet because that's a whole other issue so that's chapter four which I blank out there and chapter 5 and chapter 6 all explain about what to do with that black sot and it's basically he talks simply about what do we call it re uh, cycling the lead from that to make more lead acetate in order to do that whole first part of the process over again so we don't need to discuss that so then chapter 7 he tells us in the title the separation of the elements whereof the first is air and is also counted our ardent water a term that you'll see often used by acetate path alchemists and our water attractive now the title of chapter 8 is our ardent water or water attractive is thus made so even though we've already distilled over the ardent water he's now going to tell us how to purify it we've already separated all of these elements and now we're going to finish the separation by dividing all of the elements out of the blessed water and the first one that we're going to deal with is the acetone so Ripley tells us in in chapter 8 when all of the first element is distilled the acetone then in another still fit for it so collect the distillate the acetone that we have separated and distilled over put it into another distillation train that distillate and rectify it and anybody who's familiar with alchem chemical language knows that when you rectify alcohol you're basically distilling it a lot of times in order to remove all the water out of it and make it as pure ethanol as you can 
Well, he's telling us to do the same thing here with the acetone. That is to say, distill it over seven several times and until it will burn a linen cloth clean up that is dipped in it. So the acetone, acetone is a flammable chemical. Um, you distill it over seven times and each time you distill it it will leave a little bit of water behind and come over more pure. At the seventh time it will be like pure acetone virtually and highly flammable and also extremely volatile. So if you dip a linen bed sheet in it and then set fire to the bed sheet it will um, it will burn up that bed sheet completely then you know that your acetone is uh, in a pure condition. And that this substance now pure is called our ardent water rectified and is also called our water attractive. And you, if you've read a lot of alchemical manuscripts you'll also know that the concept that one of the substances that is used in the great work is a magnet and they always talk about the substance in a very cryptic fashion but Ripley has here just told us what that magnet is our water attractive keep it very close stopped in other words hermetically sealed for otherwise the spirit thereof, which is very subtle, will vanish away. So this acetone, once it's been distilled seven times, is so volatile that if you take a small piece of it and put it in the palm of your hand, your body temperature is enough to boil it. So it will boil at less than 30 degrees Celsius. This, this is why acetate path alchemists call this substance the water that won't wet the hands. So you need to keep it sealed carefully in a container where there is absolutely no way that it can leak out because if you take the lid off a litre of it will evaporate in about 10 minutes or less. So the next part of chapter 8 is something we don't need to discuss now because it's a side issue and we want to get on to the more important um, information here. So chapter 9 The title of chapter 9 is The Flood or Water of the Stone and one of the important things that we need to understand about this title is that that term the flood is obviously a biblical reference to Noah's flood. What Ripley is hinting at here is that the story of Noah's flood is an alchemical allegory and it shouldn't take long for anybody who understands that story and also understands a lot of the iconography or symbolism used in acetate path alchemical texts that there are a lot of similarities between the flood story and the language that is used to talk about the great path acetate work. So the flood is obviously the next element that's going to be distilled over and he tells us then draw out the flood or water of the stone by itself in another receptor in other words we've gone back to our original distillation which is the blessed water the red oil and the milky water that we're distilling we've taken the acetone off the top we go back to that we're heating it again very gently and the next thing that we'll distill over is H2O, water. And he calls that the element of water or the flood of the stone. We do that. The liquor will, will be somewhat white, so it's sort of milky. 
and that is the lack of Virginius that is talked about often that most people have no idea what it is and draw it with a very gentle fire in Balneo until they remain at the bottom of the still a thick oily substance like unto liquid pitch so when we've distilled all the water off all that's left now is at the bottom of the alembic or retort is a thick tar like substance bitumen like substance so the milky white part of the two substances the two fumes that were originally distilled we've all, we've taken that off and that's been separated into two substances acetone and water now we've got the oily part left and he tells us that once the milky white part is all removed the water and the acetone what we're left with is a tar like substance note that the liquor cometh white you must when, when the white colored liquor comes to its end put on another receiver and then all of that element is come over two or three drops of this black liquid oil given in spirit of wine will cure all poison taken inwardly and of course I don't recommend that anybody tries ingesting that substance because um, it's highly questionable whether or not it's actually toxic itself so it would be stupid to ingest that bitumous type substance so separated the acetone we separated the water the air and the water the elements of air and water and we have the red oil which is now thick and black at the bottom of the container chapter 10 our man's blood is thus made and rectified now man's blood is something that you won't hear mentioned often in alchemical texts even in acetate path texts but it is the first, actually the second solvent which is very important in the great work in order to uh, um, achieve our next goal which is the philosopher's mercury. Our man's blood is thus made and rectified. Put our ardent water upon that matter black and liquid so what we're doing is we're taking the acetone that we have rectified so it's now very volatile very pure distilled acetone and we're now going to put some of it onto that black tar stir them well together and let it so stand well covered for three hours then decant and filter what liquid comes over and put first ardent water and put fresh ardent water and repeat this operation three times so what he's saying is we're putting our distilled acetone onto that black tar stirring it up sealing it carefully leaving it for three hours decanting the liquid that comes over there'll be some goop still in the bottom of the jar filter what we decant and we're going to do this uh, three times all together until as much of the acetone has dissolved a reasonable amount of that tar like substance into itself then distill the acetone that has this black substance dissolved in it again with a small moist lent fire of balneo so we're now going to take the oil that's dissolved in the acetone put it into a retort distill it again in a water bath in other words distill it very gently at a very low temperature and do this three times so we're distilling it over then we're collecting what we've distilled and we're putting it into a fresh retort distilling it over again taking what we've distilled putting it into a fresh retort distilling it again this is the rectification 
of those two substances. Then what you have after these three distillations is what Ripley calls our man's blood rectified. And he calls it man's blood rectified because what's happened is the clear volatile acetone, which looks like pure alcohol, it isn't, it doesn't smell like it either, but it looks like it, and it behaves like it to a certain degree. When, it, when we've put that acetone on top of the black tar, it has extract, dissolve and extracted some of that black tar. And when we've distilled these two substances over three times, what will happen is, by the third time when we're distilling the acetone over, a bunch of that black tar will come over with the, with the acetone itself. In other words, these two substances have now bonded together. If we take that distillate and keep re-distilling it, they will keep both coming over together. So we have two separate substances bonded together now. One is the oil, one is the volatile acetone. These are our sun and moon bonded together. I'm not sure why he calls the substance man's blood, but I know what they believe blood to be. They believe it is a red, oily type substance that has man's spirit in it. And so this is kind of what we have here. A red, oily type substance that also has a spirit bonded to it. So if this is done properly, what we now have in the distillate is a kind of red wine like substance. And then he tells us about this substance. It is called man's blood rectified, which the workers in the secret arts of nature, in other words, the alchemists, do so seek. And so shalt thou, so hast thou the elements exalted in the virtue of their quintessence, in other words, you've purified them and made them very clean, each of the elements we've collected so far, namely the flood, which is the water, and the air. Let this blood be kept for a season. So now we're taking the man's blood, we're going to put it into a jar hermetically sealed, and we're going to leave it to digest and mature. That's what he means by leave it for a season. Chapter 11, the oil or fire or the earth of the stone. So this is a confusing title to the 11th chapter because anybody who studied uh, magic or alchemy in the uh, mainstream will know that oil and fire are kind of the same substance and alchemy oils or sulfurs are fiery in nature but most people do not associate the element of earth with oil or fire but we'll see why in a minute that Ripley does this <coughs> so he next instructs us <coughs> then put up the flood in other words, take the water that we've collected, or water, upon the black and soft matter, or earth of the stone. So what he's telling us there is that when we put the acetone onto that tar-like oil, put it on, taken it off three times, and extracted some of that tar-like oil, what it has left behind is a black, thick, but also grainy mineral type substance. And this is what he calls the earth of the stone. So once the oil part has been removed and bonded to the acetone, and now is called man's blood, what's left at the bottom of that oil is the element of earth. So he's now telling us to put the flood or water 
upon that black and soft matter or earth of the stone let them be well mingled together and then distill the whole until there remain in the bottom an earth most dry and black which is the earth of the stone save the oil that has been distilled over with uh, extracted and distilled over with the water for a season close stopped anywise so now we've extracted the black tar like oil with the acetone and here in the 11th chapter we've taken the grossest part of that oil which is actually a soft mineral earth the earth the element of earth and we've extracted it with water and that water has also lifted off some more washed the mineral and lifted off some more oil with it so he's now saying at the at the end of <coughs> chapter 11 save the oil with the water those two things that are bonded together for a season in a close stopped jar now chapter 12 the title is simple and straightforward the fiery water and anybody who's a Kabbalist and has played close attention to esoteric Kabbalistic literature will have seen that term fiery water before in Hebrew it's Ashmayim and it's related to the heavens and the creation of reality and so Ripley is hinting here <coughs> that the next thing we're going to deal with the fiery water is a seriously important substance it is Kabbalistically related to the early stages of creation and is also a serious substance in alchemy and I'll explain why in a second uh, most people completely overlook this chapter have no idea what they're looking at when they read this because they're not properly studied Kabbalists properly studied Kabbalists almost never read alchemical texts and if they do they really don't know what to look at and alchemists people who study lab alchemy usually don't study Kabbalah well enough to know that a lot of alchemists back in the day were Kabbalists and they use Kabbalistic ciphers to discuss what they were doing chapter 12 the fiery water then beat this black earth into a powder so after that earth has been extracted with the water it's actually a mineral now and it can be dried and ground in a mortar and pestle into a powder and mingle it with the man's blood so remember the man's blood is two substances bonded together the most volatile and essential oil portion of the original red oil that we distilled from the red fume and a clear volatile acetone which is the essential pure and volatile part of the milky substance that we originally distilled and they've been bonded together so what this does is it takes the original solvent that we produce which is the acetone it's actually a solvent this is the first solvent of the stone and bonded it with a red oil which is largely composed of phenolic compounds what this does is it changes the nature of the acetone and increases its solvent ability so now those two things join together which Ripley calls man's blood can do something together that the acetone couldn't do by itself and he's going to tell us what that thing is now because he's now saying dry the black earth the element of earth powder it and put the man's blood onto it so what we're doing is we're expecting the man's blood in some way to dissolve and extract a substance out of that black earth let it stand for three hours 
in a, that will be in a sealed container. After that, distill it on ashes. So we're not using a water bath anymore. We're using a slightly, we're using an ash bath, which which is, allows us to get uh, control a, a higher temperature. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough. Um, with a good fire. So we want a reasonable amount of heat in order to um, make this distillation work properly. So man's blood goes on the black salt, we distill the man's blood off and reiterate or repeat this process three times. So we put the man's blood onto the black earth, we distill it off, we take that distillate we put it back onto the black earth, distill it off again, take that distillate, and what this repeated re or reiterated process does is it allows the man's blood to get into the black earth and to dissolve a part of it and extract something out of it and carry it over the still head with itself. Then, when we've done that three times, it shall be called water of the fire rectified. Water of the fire rectified. And so hast thou three of our elements exalted into a virtue of their quintessence, namely water, air, and fire. So... <coughs> He's not being entirely clear about what's actually happening here and expects only the most experienced lad al alchemist to really understand what's going on here. That the man's blood is dissolving something in that earth and pulling it over the still head with those three distillations. So now, in the distillate, that we have at the end, we have three substances combined together, not just the two anymore, we now have three substances combined together, exalted in their quintessence. What he means by that is that now the purest parts of those elements are now bonded together, made into a uh, quintessence work in progress. Chapter 13 the earth then calcine the black the earth black and dry so once we've driven that man's blood off that black earth three times we're going to be left with a black mineral dry residue at the bottom this is the last part of the substances which we originally collected from the pyrolytic distillation and this is the actual element of earth. Calcine that black earth which is put it in a crucible in a furnace and heat it to excess. He says a furnace of reverberation <coughs> until it become very fine white calx. So in other words, we want to take that black earth and heat it, calcine it in a reverberation furnace until it is converted into a white powder. And this is what the alchemists most often called the calx of a mineral or metal. Chapter 14, and this is the last one we're going to look at here because this is the culmination. But I'm just going to go back just quickly to 12, this fiery water, and tell you something important about it. That fiery water is the alkahist. That ash mayim fiery water is the alkahist. And we know it's the alkahist because... In chapter 12, it has a property which is entirely novel to this substance. And that is that the man's blood is capable 
of extracting a special salt out of the earth which the alchemists call the secret fire and this is why in chapter 11 he talks about oil of fire or the earth of the stone and then talks about the fiery water that man's blood has been used to extract something out of that earth which changes the nature of that solvent into what is known as the alkahist. The alkahist was kept so secret and to, even today is virtually unknown what it is, how to make it, because it itself has a special property, something that is novel to it, something that only it can do, and that is that it can produce philosophic mercury. And we're going to see that in the final chapter we're going to talk about here which is chapter 14 the water of life which is our mercury and our lunary he's trying to not be too blatantly obvious here but you don't have to be too learned in alchemical law l-o-r-e in order to understand that <coughs> what Ripley's talking about here this water of life which is our mercury not common mercury quicksilver it's our mercury that and our lunary so what he is talking about is philosophic mercury so this is the end of the section I came here to talk about in this podcast in chapter 14 so what does he say he says mingle with this white calx in other words the element of earth that's been calcined to white the fiery water and and so that is the man's blood that had also been passed over the residue of black earth to extract something out of it distill it with a strong fire all off as before and calcine the earth again that remaineth in the bottom of the still and then distill it again with the strong fire as before then again calcine it and thus distill and calcine seven times until all the substance of the calx be lifted up by the limbic and then thou hast the water of life rectified and made indeed spiritual so we're putting the man's blood which has something in it that's been added by running it over the remains of the the residue of the black earth that black earth is calcined and that activated alkahist is now put on to the white calx and distilled off seven times and in between each distillation that white calx is recalcined and what will happen is Ripley tells us it only takes seven reiterations what will happen is that all of that element of earth or salt will lift over with um, the man's blood and so now we have actually three of the elements bonded together if we take that distillate at the end of those seven uh, distillations if we take the final distillate put it into a clean retort and distill it again there'll be no residue left behind in the retort or in the alembic that means that the acetone, the, the pure acetone, the essential acetone, the essential oil, and now what is a sublimated essential salt, that these things have all been combined back together again. 
<clears throat> and to a certain degree there is probably a small amount of water or H2O in there. In other words, this final substance, which is called the philosophic mercury, or the philosopher's lunary, lunaria, is the four elements bonded into one substance which can't be separated again by simple distillation. The water of life rectified and made spiritual. So thou hast the four elements now exalted in the virtue of their quintessence. This water will dissolve all bodies and putrefy them and purge them. So this is, he's describing the property of philosophic mercury here. This is what philosophic mercury is supposed to be able to do. It will dissolve all minerals, basically. That's what he means by bodies, calxes, minerals and metals. It will putrefy them in order, in other words, it will cause them to go through a special kind of a, a decomposition and uh, separation process. Purge them, in other words, whatever body you put into philosophic mercury when it putrefies that body, it causes a separation of the pure part of that body and its impurities which will precipitate in a solution. This water will dissolve all bodies and putrefy them and purge them and this is our mercury and our lunary uh, the term that um, Ramon Lull most often used was lunaria and he was being cryptic in using that term because lunaria is actually a plant and he was kind of using a metaphor to associate the substance with that plant and whosoever think of that there is any other water, and by that he means solvent, than this is ignorant and a full, and shall never be able to come to the effect. In other words, by effect he means without this specific solvent, you won't be able to cause that putrefaction and purging of all bodies which is necessary for the next stage of the great work. So I'm now just going to quickly recapitulate upon what I have, the important parts of what I have just explained here by using this diagram which is in the background. So in step one of the process, which is the first part of the, the acetone, the uh, acetate process that I've described in previous podcasts, we started off with the green line, which is represented by this grey circle, the chaos, and this green circle. And pyrolysis gave us a white fume, white mercury, and a red fume, or red sulphur, and left behind that sooty salt. That's the first part of the process. Then the second part of the process, step two, we have divided the white mercury into water, the flood, and into acetone or air. And we divided the red mercury or the sulfur into fire, which is an essential oil and that earth got that got calcined in to a white state. So these two diagrams explain all that. Then the last part of the process is the recombining back together of the four elements. So those four elements are first purified and then 
recombine back together into one homogeneous substance. <clears throat> this is a really important thing to understand because a lot of people who have studied Frater Albertus's system and listen to what he has said and think about alchemy in the way he described it will become very confused about what to do in this second stage which I've explained here because he speaks about principles mercury sulfur and salt not the elements and so that causes a lot of confusion because it's not the principles which are the important thing they are separated but they're not the important thing what he leaves out of his version of the story is a description of the elements and what they are and how they are separated and then purified and then recombined according to this Bagari process separation purification recombination so we've talked about all of that part of the process right up to this point okay so in this podcast I've described I've crossed the line and described a number of important secrets which people have been arguing about forever if you sit on forums and listen to people discuss lab alchemy in general and the great work or the acetate path specifically you'll often hear arguments and debates about the nature of acetone and what it is where it comes from the role it plays what it is the alkahist what it is where it comes from what its properties are and philosophic mercury everybody knows that philosophic mercury is a major step in the process and you will virtually never hear anybody give an explanation of exactly what it is and how it's produced where you could reproduce what they say and have it do what it is supposed to do which we will dis- which I will describe in the next podcast so here I've cleared up all of that debate and argument for anybody who has even a small reasonable amount of experience in the lab you should be able to follow the instructions I've given here and produce the legendary philosophic mercury our lunaria one of the biggest secrets in the process of producing the stone without this water as Ripley refers to it you can't do the next thing in the process which is that you have to take two or three different substances and dissolve them in a way that leads immediately to the production of a transmutation agent without that dissolution there is no elixir and there is no philosopher's stone so you need this solvent in order to carry out the next step and I'm going to repeat again for anybody who hasn't paid attention previously I don't know how regularly I'm able to produce and upload these podcasts so sometimes it's going to take a little while to get them out but I think anybody who knows about lab work and who has struggled with the questions and issues that I'm discussing here will quickly agree that what I'm describing is worth waiting for so thank you again for watching if you got this far I hope you found this informative please leave any questions in the comment section I always read the comments and I reply to them 99% of the time especially if they're 
sensible and intelligent. And we'll see you in the next podcast, which will be about the next stage of the work after the production of The Philosopher's Mercury. Till then. That's the